don't take this paper too seriously. It should be a starter for the coming discussion. So we thought about like uh, giving you a few what you call inputs and input sounds, um, input thoughts. You need to start oh, with your story. So um, I'm not going to introduce you to the history of either of them because I assume everybody in this room, because you've come to this talk, knows approximately what these two worlds are about. We're also talking only about of the Lord of the Rings, so I will not go into the other stories because they're very different in their conception. So what I wanted to do instead is look at it and tell you how they differ in the way their the narrative goes. So first days, like... Um, what you see in Middle Earth is what is considered an epic storytelling. So you have a fictional narrator. It is written in a very elegant and sometimes hard to read language. And the general theme is one of universal importance. So, you know, destroying the ring and not taking e let, letting take evil over the world. Then there's a mo it has a high moral lesson to the reader and that comes with many different characters and not just a single one. And in general, it re recounts very heroic deeds of valor and bravery and everything. So all these characteristics, you find them in literature, and they tell you it's an epic story. Um, maybe it was potentially is inspired by Tolkien's life, but it's much more inspired by myths and other epics of the past. So it is not designed as a realistic impression of reality. It is designed to tell a story and to educate the reader. Whereas, um, so first spoiler warning, um, Game of Thrones potentially has multiple fictional narrators, we still don't know. Um, the, but the language of every chapter reflects the narrating character, so it's not usually not an elegant or sublime language. It's more, you know, depending on how educated the person is. Um, the central theme, there's this, I would say, is probably the dynastic war that's laid out of all these books. But for me, the much more universal, important theme would be actually the destruction of the world by the others or the White Walkers. We have a lot of moral ambiguity. There are themes of loyalty, pride, piety, and all these other things. Also, violence and sexuality, which are not explored in the Lord of the Rings because they are not part of epic storytelling. And that is a realistic impression. They, this is how people usually really are. They're not just, you know, are heroes because they're heroes. They're usually acting because they want something. And we see that also in the inspiration, which is probably um, mostly by the War of the Roses in England, and also by historic novels. So keep this in mind, because when we model the past, we are somewhere between these two ways. Like, there are people who see it, like the medieval times is a romantic dark age where everything was beautiful, but in reality it was not. So this is where, you know, this diachronism where we walk on when we model. So I thought I'd just, you know, bring you that. So what is the important thing for modeling is coming from the pen and paper role-playing perspective, the Lord of the Rings has clear character alignments. People are either good or evil. There are few characters which are sort of a gray line. You don't have that in Westeros. People have what's called a shady or broken character alignment, so they're just, you know, chaotic evil sometimes. Their actions are driven by a personal or dynastic gain. They don't do it for the greater good. And if you perform a heroic action, it's usually discouraged because you're usually killed. You don't... <laughs> Well, you don't have that in a lot of the rings. If you perform lots of heroic actions, you might eventually become a great king. So we have this almost complete absence of altruism, which is what probably derives lots of human actions. But the point is, if we model that, it gets very, very different. And that's mostly what Leonard will be talking about, because I will be talking about what I do, and I do lots of spatial stuff. So I want to talk about how we you know, interpret all this because all these people have like ancestral seats where they sit on, which are sort of castles or whatever. And so this is what I will be talking about and Leonard will be talking about much about what I introduced right now as a background. So if you look at Middle Earth, what I do now is uh, I looked at this map, which is readily available on the internet. And if you look at the ancestral seats and that's the Vernoid tessellation of it, you get really interesting results. So I hope that most of you are at least a little bit familiar. So we see that there are problems, and that's mostly edge effects. 
And, but on the other side, we see like these stars are the ancestral seats, so it's like Baraduo, Gondor, no, not Gondor, sorry, uh, Minas Tirith, and there's also Hobbiton up there, although that's actually not a regional capital. But what you can see is there are parts missing because we have Rivendell up there, but we actually don't, for example, have anything in the Mirkwood, although we know. And that's like something I just want to emphasize. If you do spatial modeling based on Hillfort or whatever, we only get what we assume to be an ancestral seat, and we have to center on these things. There are lots of other towns on this map, but we just don't see them. Also, we have lots of dark spaces, basically everything that goes down like on this side from Mordor, well, we know what there is. There are desert people and they have a very different culture from everyone, but they're just not there because we don't have evidence in that case. Also, I just want to remind you, these territories do not reflect anything, although Middle-earth is said to have a very, very good chronology and territories are as they could be if it would be a real world. Do you want to say anything? What's important about this is that Tolkien only put places on the map that he needs for his narration. So that's why this house is that empty, because the story never goes further south than um, the, uh, what's the English name? Schicksalsberg. Mount Doom. Uh, than the Mount of Doom, <coughs> of course. <laughs> and, uh, but this is something that's also reflected in the archaeological record. We are missing places. We won't get them. We won't see them. And we will consider places more important if they're more excavated, if we have more data on them. They become overly important to our models, but they might not have been in the past. So, just a quick... Uh, yes, I know, that's why I said just quick about Westeros. So, people have estimated the scale. We have nine major ancestral seeds and the capital, which is apparently not... Um, it has the crown lands. So this is where these seeds are, and you can immediately see that places like Old Town are not an ancestral seed, and we don't get them. So if we look at that, we see a presence of natural fortification and uh, castles for capitals. We have a close association to water, major trading routes, and few satellite cities. Few satellite cities is a problem because that's what we use usually if we do modeling. And now, if you look at... Um, the way, this is like, the sigils are where the capitals are depending on the um, shape. And what we see is that the capital is not central. And most archaeological and spatial models assume that the most important part should be in the center. Just as an idea to keep. And I think I'll leave it with that. Oh ah, yeah, and by the way, if you try to triangulate Vernoy with the classic Cugis procedure, it tells you that there are few too few points, but you know, if you use a plugin, you still can get the Lonely Triangulation, which is basically the same thing. And I think it's one of the most beautiful edge effects I have seen in a very long time. So, okay. so now we come into Game of Thrones. So there's some serious spoilers ahead. We have 20 seconds to leave the room in order to get spoiled. So, what I do, I mostly do agent-based modeling, and I um, <clears throat> did uh, a big model on game theory, on uh, a spatial model, and at some point I thought like, it would be a good, cool idea to um, code like the, the, the fractions, the alignments, the houses of Game of Thrones. But here we see a lot of the acting characters. These are actually the characters that are mentioned most in the books. And um, if, you, um, uh, if you know, um, the, uh, sorry, if you're familiar with the series, then you will know that some of them not even aligned to a fraction. So if I want to model fractions, I first need to take a look which characters are uh, any good for modeling a fraction, so you can boil that down. But now we have uh, a major player for every house in um, the series and in the books, but some of these houses don't really have a strategy that I could um, uh, model. They don't have a strategy that I could cope. I mean, like, look at the Kastaks over there. What are they doing, actually? How, how are they playing in terms of um, um, a game theory approach? So, what we have to do is we have to cut down further to the main houses. So, now I was uh, saying, uh, I was uh, throwing out the term um, game theory a lot. So, what is game theory? Game theory can be very easily um, explained with the prisoner's dilemma. Think of two people that robs a bank, and both of these people get caught. Now, we have different situations, because every one of these two prisoners can do 
um, one thing or the other. He can confess or he can remain silent. Let's see, in scenario A, both confess, and both of them get sentenced to five years. It's not the worst outcome, because if one of them confesses and one of them stays silent, the other one will get jailed for 20 years. So um, what both could do, what would be the more optimal outcome, is if both stay silent, nobody can... Um, uh, they will both be jailed for one year because it's not sure who actually robbed the bank or who actually came up with the plan. So we can um, use this prisoner's dilemma and instead of confess uh, and not confessing and stay silent, we can use the terms cooperate and defect. So um, let's imagine we play a few rounds of this prisoner's dilemma. It's not about sentences of getting sentenced once, it's about like getting the highest gain out of multiple rounds. So we can see how the opponent acts and um, how myself was acting, and if we both cooperate, both of us will get a payout of four. It's not too bad. If the opponent defects and I cooperate, I get an outcome of five. If, um, uh, if the opponent cooperates and I defect on him, I will get nothing. And um, then there's also the we defect each other scenario in which we get three. So from this we can um, receive a lot of strategies. There's a lot of literature on the different strategies in game theory. And I will make it very, very easy and just show you a few um, strategies that can be chosen. The, the strategy relies on what my enemy played the last round. So if I see that he was cooperating and I was cooperating, if I take the... Uh, strategy number one, always cooperating, I will cooperate. But since it's, um, the strategy is named always cooperating, you can see clearly C, 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 I will just always cooperate, no matter what happens. It's not a real good tactic if you want to have a big payout. So another thing would be to just play stubborn and don't pay any attention to what my um, opponent does. Just play cooperate, cooperate, defect, defect, cooperate, cooperate, defect, and hope to get as much gain out of it as possible. Also not an optimal strategy. Then there's the tit for tat strategy, where I look closely what the opponent did, and then I do the same. Like, if he's cooperating, I will cooperate in the next turn. If he defected on me, I will defect on him the next turn. So tit for tat is a very good strategy, because if you um, encounter an always cooperating um, opposite, you will cooperating. If you um, um, uh, have a bully as the opposite who will always defect you, or mostly defect you, you will defect him uh, in retaliation. So, um, when we code these models, there is one strategy that, if it's not a spatial model and if not has any mutation into it, always wins. And that strategy is tit for tat. So, the tit for tat strategy is like the optimal strategy if we don't have random new strategies upcoming and if we don't have any um, uh, things in there like spatial boundaries. So, the conflicts in Westeros are not spatial, right? I mean, the north uh, fighting the south and in between there are other houses, so this is not much doing. So let's take a quick look at these main houses. You might know these logos, and if not, then you will soon do. So here you know the dragon, it's the Khaleesi, and she is more or less playing an always retaliate strategy. If people like defect on her, she defects on them. The same goes for the House of Lannisters. Um, the Norse, um, the Starks, they are a little bit complicated because they're mostly playing always cooperate in the beginning and they pay a high price for it and then they might change for something like being stubborn and they pay an even higher price for it. So, um, which of these houses do you think would actually win? Who's playing tit for tat? The only house that plays tit for tat is the house of Tyrell. And so the conclusion from an agent-based model is that Westeros would be governed by one of these two queens. And here's like the major, major spoiler. They're both dead. That won't happen. We have a problem here. And the problem that we have um, is not on the data quality, which Chiara will upon us. The, the problem we have is it's complicated to model behavior. It's complicated to model irrational behavior without just having a mutation into it. It's just random in a model. You cannot um, model all these different strategy changes, alignment changes, um, in a certain way. There was no way I was able to give these houses the according strategies and come to an outcome that's in the novels. So what can we learn from that? 
we should be very careful with our models. We should be very careful when we model human behavior because human behavior gets reduced to equitations. And these equitations can be wrong to very complex behavior. So, yeah. so I continue with the like boring part of it. So um, what is we had yesterday, like two days ago, it's this kind of grain of sands that accumulate and then there comes the avalanche and that's what we can't model. And that's, well, due to many things, but one of them in archaeology is data quality. And that's usually, we think about where does our data come from, and then we have like stuff like a scientific survey of the area, which would be like these maps, because we have some parts, but not all of them. Then we have like small-scale excavations that would be when we know that, I don't know, King's Landing has certain kinds of fortifications, whereas, I don't know, the Twin Towers are very different. But... We have these old reports, meaning that, you know, like all the data from Essos could be really old before Daenerys gets there and stuff like that. We have analog data that we digitize in some way, we categorize it, and that's how we also end up in not being able to place a strategy. Because we think about the data in a certain way, and that will be translated. And also we have location errors, because we don't really know where things are, or people didn't tell us, or there is not GP no GPS data for it. So... The most common pitfall, I would say, is choice of algorithm. And ah, usually, we don't meet the assumptions. And if we do, we end up in something like Lennox said. We have met all the requirements for the agent-based model. We have all the data, and still it doesn't work. And that's, well, I tend to believe chaos theory, so sensitivity on initial conditions, because we can't ever recreate them. So we predetermine by choosing this algorithm, like testing against CSR or whatever, what we want to know. And that's the only thing that we will ever get because we can't just randomly ask questions with this kind of models. We can with ABM, it gets a lot better, but not with spatially constrained stuff. So that's yours, that's, I would that's say. Mine. Yeah, so um, I was already saying that, I was going a little bit ahead of the slides. Equitation needs to meet, match the complexity of human behavior, and they hardly can. And if I bring in like random mutation, think about the Houses of Westeros again, then the Lannisters are playing always cooperate because it just mutates the strategy and that's what's happening. But it can never come to the exact outcome. Of course, an agent-based model is not about recreating the past. This is not what it's about. But I try to show you the pitfalls on um, an example we could all relate to. And models need to simplify. And this is a very, very big problem. If we have a big story, if we have a complex story, if we have a lot of interacting characters, how do I simplify them? Think of the first slide I showed you. Which characters are important? It's, it's, a, um, it's a very, um, how to say, it's a very personal decision because for some of us, they would argue this character is not as important, this one's not as important. If we only know two of the five books, we might think, oh, I know who the main characters are, and then they're all dead by book three. So, simplification of complex interactions requires a lot of decision, and we must be clear about these decisions, and we must um, write down these decisions, we must formalize them, and we must make it able for the researchers after us to um, come um, to, to uh, transcript the intent of our decisions. So this is a very, very important thing, and I think it's often overlooked. I make a lot of decisions as a model, and I need to put them down somewhere. And it's not about um, if I use a random number here or there, that's one decision, but also um, what I won't model, what will I leave out? This is another thing that should be clarified. Um, and I was already uh, talking about this. Changes of strategy can only be implemented via a mutation. So we must be very careful uh, when we use mutation in our models. Then there is emerging behavior, of course, but in reality, these mutations might happen not as frequently or might be triggered by grains of sands and systems. How do we put them into models? This is an interesting um, um, question we should answer in the future. And with this, I would love to have a nice panel discussion and uh, get everyone together to evaluate a little bit on algorithms, on modeling, on spatial modeling, um, maybe going back to the papers we heard. And um, yeah. All right, thank you for it.